All right, guys, it has been far too long, and once again, I apologize. I tend to start a lot of projects at once, and some things fall through the cracks, but I am trying my hardest to improve, and I do have a really good topic for today. The topic is scientific knowledge and training, and why you shouldn't always believe what the science tells you when it comes to training methodologies, exercise selection, or anything of that sort. First of all, I want to say that I'm not trying to shit on the, the science guys, whether that's, you know, Mike Isertel or Jared Feather, who I have a ton of respect for and also consider good friends. Uh, you know, guys like Lane Norton, Jeff Depard, Craig Knuckles. I have tremendous respect for all these guys. I think they're smart guys. I think they've accomplished a lot. I think they know their field probably better than nearly anybody else in the world. Uh, and I think they're, the, the things that they teach are probably applicable more often than not. But they're not always applicable. And I want to explain why that is. To understand it, first you have to understand a little bit about the nature of knowledge itself. So this can get a little bit deep, but when you look at knowledge, we have a presentist view. What that means is we consider the things that science tells us to be fact, to be objectively true, and it's not. Science can give us a lot of information, but we only know what has been proven so far. So if you were to look at knowledge over time, right? So this is the beginning of time. Our knowledge is zero. We know caveman hungry, caveman go eat. And over time, knowledge grows, right? We learn how to write, how to communicate. We can share thoughts and ideas, things that we found out, how to build a fire, right? It's not always gonna be linear, right? You can have things like the plague where uh, knowledge is lost, essentially. But over time, our knowledge is increasing. So say we're here. We look here, we don't know any of this stuff, right? This is gonna keep going up, right? Someday we'll be able to communicate with aliens or you know, teleport or whatever. But right now we know what we know, and that's, that's this point in time. If we were to go back to another point in time, we wouldn't know any of this, right? We wouldn't have been exposed to it. The classical example of spontaneous generation, where, and I'll link to an article about this in the, in the uh, description below, but basically people believe that mice could just appear out of thin air because they didn't understand all the biological processes that are required to create a mouse. And everybody at the time accepted that because this knowledge, right, those biological processes, they hadn't been understood yet by the scientific community or by the, the general population. So this applies to any topic, but it's especially applicable when it comes to training methodologies. I have a good friend, Dominic Morris, who I went to grad school with, and he wrote a paper about the difference between tacit knowledge and formal knowledge in the strength and conditioning community. So strength and conditioning is a, a field where this is really big because a lot of your learning comes through mentorship, it comes from you know working in the field, from uh, practicals and things of that nature. So formal knowledge, stuff that's been written down. You read your textbook, you take your test, you can go apply this in the field, right? Uh, math is a great example, a lot of formal knowledge in math. Tacit knowledge, things that you kind of learn by doing, and it's very hard to communicate. So let me give you an example. Say you're a great strength coach. Let's say that you have coached hundreds of squatters, and you're a really good squatter yourself, and you've created some really good squatters. You've taken guys from 200 pound squats to 700 pound squats, from 700 pound squats to 1,000 pound squats. You know your squats. And the guy walks in the weight room and he wants your help and you watch him squat. And you, you can't really point out any textbook thing wrong with his squat. You know, he's got his spine in a neutral position. All his joints are stacked. He's not letting his hips shoot up. Uh, his knees aren't caving. His hips aren't shifting. But it looks really ugly. And you can tell from all this experience that you have working with all these other squatters that the guy needs to widen his stance, and that's it, right? He needs to widen his stance, make more room for his torso, whatever. The reason is important. What's important is that you couldn't go to a textbook and say, well, lifter B needs to widen his stance and contact C because of Z, right? You can't do that. You have to learn it by doing, by seeing, by touching. That's tacit knowledge. When it comes to strength and conditioning, when it comes to lifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding, strongman, there's a ton of tacit knowledge. And the proof 
is when you look at the difference in training methodologies between pros and everybody else, right? Let's say pros in the scientific community. If the scientific community knew everything there was to know about training, everyone on the Olympia stage would be training using, you know, the ideas of max recoverable volume, full ranges of motion when applicable, et cetera, et cetera. And instead, we see most people following a bro split, right, which science tells us not optimal frequency, but yet nearly every Olympian follows a bro split. They'd all be going through, almost all of them would go through a full range of motion, and yet we see tons of guys doing partial reps with barely any range of motion, right? We would see a vast difference in what the actual training looked like at the top end. The same would go for powerlifters, the same would go for strongman. There's this disconnect, and that disconnect is because of the tacit knowledge and because of things that we just don't understand yet. So, what do you do with that? That's not really helpful, right? It, it kind of understands, the, it, it explains why the pros don't do what the science guys say. It doesn't tell you what to do. And this is why I think it's really important, why I wanted to preface it with, I'm not trying to shit on the scientific community. The formal knowledge explains a hell of a lot. I don't want to understand, understate that. If you are just starting out, or even if you're kind of in the intermediate or even advanced stages, you should probably follow what the formal knowledge says because it does explain and will help the vast majority of people to a certain extent. Once you get past the extent, once you find that, hey, I am following everything the science says to the best of my knowledge, and I'm still not improving, or I'm not improving at the rate that I want, or I'm regressing, or I'm just really fucking bored, then you want to draw on other sources of information. Other sources of information does not mean pull something out of your ass because it seems fun. It means go look at other high level lifters who have similar builds to you and see what they're doing and try to understand why they're doing it. Go look at other high level coaches that have produced stellar athletes, right? Joe Bennett, good friend of mine. He's written a program for me, a training program. That training program does not reflect any of the frequency or volume suggestions that Mike Isretel would probably recommend. And yet, Joe Bennett has coached Olympians like Terrence Ruffin, Hunter Labrada, Cody Montgomery, probably a lot of others, Ben Paluski. So clearly Joe knows his stuff. These are the type of resources that you should go to when you're trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get a little bit away from this formal knowledge and why am I gonna get away from it, right? The why is very important. You wanna be making informed decisions, even if those decisions aren't informed on scientific evidence, they're informed on something. They could be informed on results. If you've taken copious notes on your own training and you know, hey, when I do this, my body does this, that is a great piece of evidence and is probably a lot more powerful than anything a scientific textbook can tell you about how you should modify your training, okay? So the big takeaway is that it's okay not to follow what the science says. The science can't explain anything, everything. Bro science is more than just BS. And that's an article that I wrote for Elite FTS a couple years ago. I'm gonna to link to that one too, because I think it's a good one. But what I want you to be able to do with this video is if you decide to deviate from what formal knowledge says, from you know an ideal optimal program, you can do so with confidence, you can make an informed decision, and you can explain to others why you made that decision. I think all of that's really powerful, and I think it will help to take your training to the next level. Uh, that was pretty short. I do hope you found it informative. I hope you found it helpful. If you have any feedback, any criticism, any comments for me, I would very much appreciate that. Please leave those in the uh, leave those below. And again, I am going to try and keep doing better. So uh, I will have this is cool. I will have a seminar at Pursuit Fitness in Fort Collins. That will be April. 17th, I believe, 10 a.m. It's going to be free. Uh, we do ask that you donate to some charity that the gym's going to choose. I don't know the charity. Uh, and I will be in the Denver area as well that whole week. So hopefully I get to see some of you and uh, hook up. We're going to, Taylor and I are going to try and do some more traveling in the future so that we get to meet you all. We're really grateful for the opportunity to spread as much good information as we can, uh, you know, as much good energy as we can. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.